influencer. And Jesus did this over and over and over to his disciples throughout the New Testament. You are an influencer. But today I want to just jump back into further. I want to go back further to Jesus. And I want to show you another great example today of an influencer who we would never think, in the, in the situation he was in, you would never think this person could become an influencer in any way. Because as a believer, you were created for influence. And you have more influence than you think you do. So step into the next slide. Look at this question right here that's here to the of course. This question says this. How many followers of Christ positively exert influence in a culture today? Filled with so much corruption, what feels like hatred, what feels like political divisiveness. How does somebody who is a Christian, a follower of Christ, a Jesus follower, how does somebody in a culture like this, how does a follower of Christ positively exert influence in a world like this? And I wanted to be able to show you today that this goes back to deeply to Jesus. That this goes back to Old Testament times, like the same example of someone who didn't just survive, but what did they do for them? Right. They thrived, my friend. They didn't just survive. They thrived in a culture that was hostile to Christians, angry at Christians, hated the God of the Bible. And if someone comes through to show them how this is possible, so today we're talking about somebody named Daniel. Everybody remember the story of Daniel? Daniel is fantastic. I want to show you today. Daniel's story is it, it, amazing because he does this thing where he goes from a nobody to a somebody. He does this thing where he goes from so little bit of influence to so much influence. He does this amazing thing where he goes from a captain to the leader in Babylon. So let me kind of set the stage for you here. This is about 600 years before Jesus. And about 600 years before Jesus, you've got this young man named Daniel who's about 15 or 16 years old. He's about the age of Blaine almost, okay? He's about 15 or 16, and picture that this young man, maybe you don't realize this about David. David is a descendant of King David. He's of King David's royal line of family. And so Daniel is one of the royal family in what you would consider Jerusalem. And what happens at this time? 605 BC, this wicked Babylonian king named Nebuchadnezzar. Now, modern day Babylon, what we think of Babylon, is about 50 or 60 miles south of Baghdad in Iraq, modern day Iraq. And this wicked Babylonian king comes over to the Holy Land of Jerusalem and sacks the city, lays siege to it, tears the city down, and takes all the men captive and carts them off to a hostile environment that hates the God of the Bible. These are pagans. These are Idol worshipers. They worship statues, they worship all kinds of things. That is not the one true God of the Bible. This heavenly Father, this triune God, this understanding of Jesus with God from the beginning. They don't, they don't understand it, they don't care about that. They worship idols. And so picture the 15 or 16 year old young man, about the age of Blaine, gets his home taken away from him, everything gets sacked. And they marked him about 500 plus miles up over to Babylon. And they're looking at Daniel and they're saying, This guy's really, he's really smart. And he's really well kept. And he's really kind of wise for his age. This would be a shame to like put him in slavery. Bring him to the king and bring his friends to the king. Bring his buddies or his cousins, bring them to the king. Because these men have the ability, they're, they're very intelligent, they can understand it. Bring, bring these men to the king. Even though they don't believe the same God we do, bring them in and bring them to the pagan king's court. That's what they do. So Daniel and his friends get brought to King Nebuchadnezzar's court. And here's what we have to notice. If you're going through the book of Daniel, you're seeing little things where Daniel, in a hostile environment, and I guess we think today's society is a little bit like a picnic. You might have liked it. You know, think of Daniel. Was facing right then. And they bring him in, and the first thing that they do is Daniel is 
not going to defile himself with the food and the wine and all the things that this pagan worshiping culture indulged in. They're trying to put all this stuff in front of him, and he is a young Hebrew man that is trying to be ceremonially clean to stay true to his God. The first thing he does is he goes and says, Hey, is there any way that you can allow us to just have a diet of vegetables and wine? Now, how do we know here? Were any going here that cannot have some food in the church for being in fact? Maybe not. 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 So, anybody that, that did that, you know, wow, well, you know, if you're used to modern day diet, this totally, totally changes like everything. I mean, keep the headaches and get the shakes and stuff. Whoa, well, I've got you to get rid of that. I mean, okay. Well, Daniel, Daniel was the first one that came in and said, hey, would you allow us to have a, just a, a diet of vegetables and water? And believe it or not, God's favor is shown and working with Daniel in this hostile environment. And they allow it. She's the executive and she's, you know, people in order. They said, okay, we'll allow that. That's one of the first things. Next thing. Now picture that this pagan king, he's got all of these, he doesn't know what you've got. He's bringing in sorcerers and wise men and magicians, and he's saying, I don't understand what my dreams mean. Can you make this sense for me? Make sense for me. Make sense for me. And nobody, nobody can make sense of any dream. Except for Daniel. Daniel's the only one that can interpret dreams. He doesn't want you to interpret dreams. God's moving and working through this process. It does, it's not just a, you know, when you talk about the Christian life, it's not just a hundred yard dash. Hey, I'm going to run, give you water, and that's it. No, no, I'm not doing it. I don't, I don't have to think about that anymore. I'm just, you know, it's this, it's this marathon where you're every day you're allowing yourself to be changed. You're picking up your cross and you're following him and you're allowing God to work in your life to make you more like him. That's part of the process. That's what Daniel is doing as he's going through these different administrations. So look how many administrations Daniel impacted. You would never think that this young Hebrew boy would have any impact. There's no reason for this young godly man to impact a pagan idol worshiping nation. But he does over the course of 65 years. So what I'm telling you is when we as Christians, when we sit back and we think, you know what, this world is just going to age you know, hockey sticks, and I'm just going to go bury my head in the sand, and I'm going to go run to a monastery at the edge of the cliffs, at the edge of the world, where they can't impact me. That is not what God wants you to do. God shows you something different. He wants you to make a difference in this world. What did we talk about last week? Sprinkling what? Salt. Salt. Shining what? You can't do that to the world if you're hiding your head in the sand. In a monastery at the edge of the cliff. You can't do that. You can't impact the people around you. You can't impact the world. God wants you to be faithful to Him in the midst of hostile circumstances. Okay? His role of influence was with four kings over the course of 65 years. King Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel elevated and was elevated to a ruler over the entire province of Babylon. King Belshazzar, Daniel was promoted to the third highest ruler in the land. King Darius, Daniel was an administrator who helped provide oversight to 120 satraps. The satraps would have been like, like a subordinate official, like a henchman. Go get this stuff done. I don't care what we can do, go get this stuff done. He is over 120 satraps, henchmen. Lastly, King Cyrus. Scripture simply tells us that Daniel prospered during his reign. God has the ability to move and change people in an amazing way that we would never think would be influencers, but God allowed Daniel to influence not just one king, not just four kings, <coughs> he impacted entire nations. That should not happen according to our logic. But God isn't always logic. He is miraculous. God moves in an amazing way. So let's see what's next here. How did he do this? How did he go from nobody to somebody? How did he go from captain to leader? How did he go from nothing to being everything? God's influence. Somebody say God's influence. God's influence. It's not about us. It's about allowing ourselves to be used for his influence. Because it doesn't make sense on its own. 
But Daniel's story is linked with God's favor and influence from beginning to end. And here's something else I want you to see. Next slide. Uh, I want you to see that when it comes to God's favor and influence, you can't demand it, but you can ask for it. And you can readily position yourself for it. God makes a way in Daniel's life where time and time and time again, he is in the right place at the right time. To make a huge impact for not God's people, ungodly people. And he makes a huge impact. So when we sit back and we think, I can't affect his life, I'm not an influence, I can't do that. Actually, you can. You have multiple examples of people who do it. But you have to be willing to take that step also. The book of Daniel helps you to see that. So we're just going to be in one little chapter today where we're talking about Daniel's influence. Because Daniel comes to be an influencer in his committed character. Now, last week we talked about Jesus' conduct. We talked about his speech. We talked about the way he loved. He met people where they were. He met this Samaritan woman who should not have been an influencer in any way. And he made her an influencer that influenced her entire village and the people who were around her. And changed her life for sure. This is what Daniel does also. So Daniel, I want you to see today, there's a few different points that really show how Daniel's example for you can change your example for others. And how many times have we talked about why do people sometimes not come to church? They think that Christians are hypocritical, right? Right. That's one of the first things. So what is the opposite of hypocritical faith? Authentic. Very good. What's the, you know, instead of putting myself out there like I call that and thinking I'm amazing and faking it, instead, the Bible talks about how we need to be intimately involved with God. In the, in the way that we pray, in the way that we worship, we need to be able to show that. And then, one of the things I wanted you to see today from Daniel's perspective is when the chips are down, when faith is tested, he comes out smelling like roses because of his loyalty to God. Now, how many of you are in the, in the uh, um, grocery store corner or the $10 store or whatever? You hand somebody a big bill. Maybe it's not a one dollar bill, maybe it's a decent size bill. You hand somebody a bill, and they have that little yellow marker up there by the register. Everybody know what I'm talking about? What do they do? They hold that little bill up to the light, and they're looking at watermarks, and then they, what do they do with that hand? They mark up their bill, and they're going, that's a perfectly good bill, why don't you mark it up already? They're checking its authenticity, right? Because they know that if that marker, if that iodine pin that they mark on that bill with, if it turns brown or black, it's not authentic. That is counterfeit paper. It's not authentic. If it marks yellow or amber, it is authentic. It is printed on the right paper. It's a bad deal when you get counterfeit money. You know? They don't want to get ripped off. People who are unbelievers don't want to get ripped off by fake faith of people around them. They want people to be lovingly authentic and show God's love to them. Even when we don't have it all figured out. Are we authentic in our love? So that's what we're talking about. Let's go to this first if you've got your Bibles, you can open up to Daniel chapter 6. If you want to read along with me, it'll be right there on the screen. We'll start with the first five verses. Daniel 6. How do we see that Daniel's perspective is authentic? It's tested. Now, let me show you. First of all, it pleased Darius, King Darius, to appoint 120 satraps, like I said, just ministers, to, to rule throughout the kingdom. And they had how many administrators over? Three. And who was one of them? Daniel. Daniel was one of them. The same traps were accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. King wants money, right? Influencers want money, right? In today's society, well, the king wanted to make sure they didn't suffer loss. Now, Daniel was so smart, he was organized, he was wise, he proved himself over and over and over again in every administration, even though he believed in this strange God that they didn't believe in. He showed himself above reproach, okay? Now, Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities 
that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. We'll see what this says next. At this, what happens? The guys want to do anything they can do out of jealousy, out of anger, out of hatred, out of racism, whatever it is. They want to do anything they can do to squash this man, Daniel. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his what? Conduct of government affairs. But they were what? Unable to do so. They could find what? No corruption in him. Because he was what? Trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. He had been tested over and over and over, and his faith was full of authenticity. So finally, now everybody just stop right here for just a second. Have you ever been involved in a job when people just hate to see you do good? And they get jealous, and they get angry, and they want to slander you, and they want to tear you down because you do a really good job. And you're not looking for anything in return. You're just you're wrong, you're just do a good job. You don't need all this other drama. You're just trying to do a good job. And people who don't do a good job, they get angry about it, don't they? They get jealous about it, don't they? They don't want to see you win. They want to tear you down in any way they can. Don't think that you're alone. Don't think that you're the only one there. Daniel proves this to you 2,600 years ago to give you an example. And he's just one of the ghosts. Daniel, it says, no, verse 5, finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So picture this. You do a good job at your work. You know that you do a good job at your work. You feel very proud of the fact that you do a good job at your work. And some people are so full of bitterness and anger and jealousy that they'll do anything so that you won't be elevated. And when they can't attack anything else because your character is above reproach, when they can't find anything else, what do they attack on him? His religion. They attack him and his God. They attack his spirituality. Because they don't have anything else to stand on. So they attack his faith. That says people still do that today. And so what Daniel is going to show you is this authenticity test will help you continue to rise to the top. You can't find anything wrong. But man, Daniel's character was committed wholeheartedly to God personally. He knew that God directed his steps. He knew that God was in charge. He knew that God could see everything that he couldn't see. And he prayed to God three times a day. We're going to read this in just a second. He prayed to God all day, every day. So let's think about this. What is authentic? You know, uh, Wednesday nights, those of you who aren't joining us on Wednesday nights, you should, because it's fantastic. We have great discussion on Friday. Wednesday nights, um, in, in our adult class, we've been talking about, uh, and you alluded to this, we've been talking about the Andy Stanley series called Christian. It's not just Andy. Because Christians sometimes feel like a very broad word. But what Andy Stanley is telling you is in the Bible, in the New Testament, Jesus' followers were mostly called disciples. They weren't called Christians until later on. They were called disciples until Acts 11 26. And so the point is, is over and over and over again, John, especially John, he says, he's telling the story of Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And what's the, what's the next one? Love your neighbor, right? So John says, love one another. As I have loved you, love one another. And then he goes on to say, by this, everyone will know that you're loved. If you love one another. So there's that love thing, right? Jesus loved everybody, right? Jesus have a problem with religious people too. We talked about that last week. When people, when people who are unbelievers say, I hate religion, I hate people who are religious, you have to help remind them Jesus had a really bad experience with religious people too. They put him on a cross and killed him. 
right? And now he's alive again because he's God. That's all. That's why you still become God. Okay? You're not serving something that doesn't exist. You're serving something very powerful that does exist. Okay? Daniel's character was committed to God personally. It's all thinking. You know? So what if we think about that? So how do we know this? If I was asking you, if the first step of authenticity, according to Jesus, is how are you loving God and how are you loving others? That's your question. How are you doing? Did you say I'm doing good? Did you say, oh, I'm not doing great yet. Okay. So if you're not doing great at that, then when people look at you, they may not see an authentic faith. Okay? I mean, that's not a judgment. That is something you can think about. Okay? What's another? What's another? First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians says pray continually or pray without ceasing. And then love. Pray continually. Pray continually and give thanks in all circumstances. How are we doing that? You know, are we pray some pray as soon as they wake up, some pray at noon, some pray, you know, before meals, some pray before they go to bed, some pray while they're driving to work, some pray before something crazy is about to happen at work. Some pray when they really feel down. And and when the Apostle Paul says in First Thessalonians, pray continually. And give thanks in all circumstances. If that is another mark of a authentic faith, how are we doing? Do we pray continually? Or do we not pray at all? Do we let somebody else pray for us so we can have a prayer? If that's a mark of a Christian, of an authentic Christian, then how are we doing? Because we're not doing it very well, that may not show things to be authentic. You see what I'm saying? That's where the, and, and I love this. As Christians, authenticity gives credibility to our commitment. Now see, anytime you looked at Daniel, even in a hostile situation, he was going to shine light for God. He was going to shine light in every circumstance because he was above reproach. And the point is, if he was faking his relationship with God, it would be very quickly shown. You can't fake a relationship with God. You can't even delegate your relationship with God. I've had people say, Jeremy, I can't pray. Go back to deep ministry. Jeremy, I can't pray. Would you just pray for me every day? I can't pray. And what do I start to do? I start to use this five things of prayer. Okay? Do y'all know what five things of prayer is? I can do it. Ask me our kids. This is five things of prayer. When some people, whenever they say, I don't know how to pray. Don't, don't give me the child's version of prayer. Show me how to pray. Okay? Well, how did Jesus pray in Matthew 6? So on that. Right? Go in your room, you can do this, do some words, our fathers are in heaven, blah, 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 right? That's the Lord's Prayer. Okay, that's an example for you. Um, I also teach people the Acts Prayer, the ACTS, uh, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. That's another form of prayer that we can teach. The point is, you've got people all over this church that can help you pray. So don't make that an excuse. Because God sees through your excuses and what should be better than your excuses. Does that make sense? Don't stop it. Well, I can pray. So I'm not going to pray. Just pray for me. I can't pray. Okay, then I'm going to help you learn how to pray. Because if you're not getting it, if you don't have this connection to your Heavenly Father, then you're missing something that gives you an authentic faith in your Heavenly Father. You're missing it. You're delegating it to somebody else. That is not what God wants you to do. Don't delegate your faith. Be in it. You need to personally own it. Okay? So that is authenticity. The next thing we're talking about. Everybody say, what's the next one, Sierra? The next one is, uh, what is that girl? It is empathy. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> Had a mind blink there for a second. Okay, let's go back to that. Let's go back to that. Uh, that there you go. 6 to 10. Daniel 6 to 10. So we talked about authenticity, and then when the chips are down, are we intimate in our understanding of our prayers to God? Look what it says right here. These guys want to give Daniel anywhere they can. These administrators and satraps went as a group to the king and said, May King Darius live forever. Hey, hey, you king, I'm going to build you up really big. I'm going to make you so like God, okay? All right? So we can get rid of this other guy. Hey, King Darius, may King Darius live forever. The royal administrators and prefects and satraps and advisors and governors all agree that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty. Then, in that case, issue the decree, put it in writing so that it cannot be altered. 
in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. Basically, he's saying, we don't know how to get rid of Daniel any other way. So let's write a law that makes it illegal to practice his faith. Let's make a law that makes it illegal to pray to his God. Let's make a law that goes above human government and tries to squash everything that God has already ordained. Let's make a law. And so that's what these people try to do. If anybody prays to anyone except for you, great King Darius, may you live forever, then may they be put to death. Let's make it where this cannot be altered. And when they do that, that means the king can't be All right? Let's go forward. So what did King Darius do? He put the decree in writing. That's, that's a great idea, God. That's very good. That's a great idea. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, what did he do? He went home to his upstairs room where the windows were open toward Jerusalem, and did he stop praying? No. He prayed all the morning. Three times a day, with those, those windows open to Jerusalem, where people could even hear him. He got down on his knees, and he prayed, giving thanks to God, and what's the last line there? Just as he done before. Remember I was talking about eat my mouth? Don't eat my mouth. Remember that? When I do something good, don't eat my mouth. Don't squash it. Don't make me feel like this. Don't eat my mouth. Look, they tried to kick Daniel's mouth. They tried to kick God's mouth. And Daniel was out <coughs> Daniel was authentic. And Daniel was intimately connected to his heavenly father. They weren't going to change him. Just because the government wanted to change with their law that God would be affected, it didn't affect the believer. Okay? What's next, sister? So here's the end of the success. Daniel's character was committed. Now, guys, whenever you're tested, let me ask you something. When your faith has been tested, sometimes it really reveals how committed you are. When you go test drive a car, you're testing the quality of the drive of that car. You know, when somebody, when your grandma makes an apple pie that's the family recipe, you're, ooh, I need a taste test for that. Right, Wesley? Hey, that's good stuff. Man. Grandma, that sure is good apple pie. You're testing the quality of the ingredients. When something is tested, it shows the commitment in that moment. Daniel is going to be pressed on all sides like a diamond, like a piece of coal, right? And what does pressure do? Makes a beautiful diamond. Pressure and pressure and pressure and pressure and pressure. It forms character. It forms and it refines. It makes something special. That is what sometimes trials and tribulations do to us. But in those moments, do we instead run away from God or do we run closer and further toward God? Do we run to the other in this intimate way that says, Lord, I am committed to you because I trust you. And I know that whatever is happening, it is seen by you. And you've got it. You've got it. So there's the authenticity thing. Do people see us as authentic? Then there's the intimacy thing. Do, do people see us faithfully, prayers? Or do they feel like that we really are in this with God? God is really trying to move through us. He's really trying to work in us. And keep in mind, guys, none of us are perfect. We all mess up. We all do stupid things. None of us have the perfect prayer, okay? But to God, you have the ability to do everything if you trust Him. This next slide shows this. As Christians, intimacy gives what? Credibility. Authenticity gives credibility. Intimacy gives credibility to our commitment of God. So don't just fake prayers. Okay? We're bigger than that. We're better than that. Don't just tell me your prayers. I can't pray. I'll never be able to pray, so don't even ask me to try. Don't ask me to learn. I'm not going to try. Even though they give us examples, I'm not going to try. Just pray for them. Okay? I'd love to pray for you. But that's not helping you grow. That's not helping you mature in your faith. That's just me saying, okay, I guess whatever you want is best. And that's not necessarily what God wants. 
So we need to personally pray. We need to personally own our faith in God. We need to personally pray. And the last, last thing we're talking about today, we talked about authenticity, we talked about intimacy, and here's the last one. The last one is the loyalty test. Thank you, here. Now let's read our scripture for today. So as we're wrapping up this part of Daniel, it says loyalty. That's what you're talking about. These men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and they spoke to him about his royal decree that they had just kind of strong arms and into. Hey, king, be awesome if you just go ahead and make it legal for anybody to be able to pray. Anybody except for you, because you're a good king, Darius. Yes, you're amazing, you're actually okay. And so they got, did you not just publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to you, anyone who prays to any god or human being accepting you, your majesty, will be thrown in the lion's den? And the king says, yeah, the decree stands. And the law reads the Persians, which cannot be fulfilled. Okay? He hears he knows what he did, knows what he said, he gave him a pill. All right? Then they sent to the king Daniel. Daniel, who's one of the exiles from Judah? Who's in your court? Who has served you faithfully? That one pays no attention to you. They can't find any fault in how he works. So they attack his faith. That's all they have. They can't do anything else. Because he's above reproach. This exile from Judah pays no attention to your majesty or to the decree that you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. And when the king heard this, he was greatly what? He's got a conscience. He's got a conscience too. He realizes this is wrong. He knows what kind of a stand up person Daniel is. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been exalted to such a high position. He's never cheated him. He's never done anything wrong to the king. Except for he knows that King Darius is not God. That's all they have. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and make every effort until sundown to save him. In verse 15, it says this. Then the men went as a group to King Darius and said to him, Remember, your majesty, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. When evil is on their side and they feel like they have the momentum, they'll carry out whatever plan they can. But you can't stop God. You might think that you can stop the ways of God. Well, you can't stop God. So the king gave the order. And they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. And the king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, may he rescue you. The king didn't want to throw Daniel in the lion's den. He'd been swayed, persuaded, strong. A stone was brought. Does that sound, does that sound familiar at all? A stone was brought. You think we're going to order the opening of this lion's den? The Persians love to capture lions. I just love to go into places like this and tear people apart. And even with his own signet ring, he sealed it. And with the rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Nothing could save Daniel at this point, except for his plan. That's it. When all the evil plans of men get followed through, and your character and your faith is tested, where do you turn? Do you say, well, I guess God wasn't really here all along. I guess God just snowed me and just left me hanging the whole time. No. That's what the world will love you to believe. That's not what happens. God does remember you. God does know how to move. God does know how to make a miracle happen. God can change everything. And so this happens. Go for it. We have the loyalty test. In those moments, all Daniel had to do was say something different. He, had, he could have easily said no, that he didn't serve God. Sound familiar like somebody else we talked about on Easter night? Right, right before the stone was rolled over the entrance of the lion's den? Sound familiar? Foreshadowed. God knows what he's doing. He repeats things. He's trying to help them see that God has been going on all along. He's trying to help them see that. Daniel's character was committed to God under pressure. 
The same thing happens to us. When the chips are down and times get hard, what do we do? Do we wilt and faint and fall away and curse God and say, God, what are we doing here? Or do we even make it strong enough and say, my God can shut the mouth of the lions. My God can change us through that. My God can move that mountain from here to there. My God can do anything my God wants to do because I trust in him. That's what Daniel believed. That's why Daniel was a brother of approach. That's why Daniel, Daniel's story is to prove to you that you are not alone. So come to this slide. As Christians, authenticity, intimacy, and loyalty gives credibility to our commitment. We can't fake our faith in God. We can't delegate our faith in God. We need to personally grow our faith, especially in moments when we are pressed on all sides and it feels like we're going to buckle under pressure and the waves of this storm are so high that we're going to drown. Especially then. That's when you need to remember that your God loves you and has you in everything. Let's see. So here's a question for you today. When people look at you, keep in mind that they're not perfect, and we all mess up and we all do dumb things at times. But where's our faith life? And is it authentic? Is your character awesome? In your speech, in your conduct, in your love, in how you are authentically connected to God, how you're intimately connected to God, in how your loyalty is to God. Is your faith Christ? And if that question is hard for you to answer, then let's pray about it together. Let's figure out how to help you get back on the right Bible plan. Let's help you figure out how to be connected with your men's and women's ministry. Let's help you figure out how to be able to study together and have prayer together. Sometimes just pulling away at the drawing is not the answer. Sometimes you have to take a committed character step forward and say, God, you are my God, and I'm going to be in with you on this. I'm going to be all in with you on this. Instead of slinking away and saying, yeah, that's, that's too hard. I don't really think I'm that committed to God. I don't really think my character is for God. I really think I just want to stick with the kiddos in this society and just exalt myself and just go from there because that's where the influence are going to take society. They don't influence from God's perspective. So that's your question for today. Are you committed? Would people think that you were committed? Because as Christ followers, our character and our commitment should make what? Our character and our commitment should make a believer want to feel more connected to Jesus. By how? By the way we love one another. Not to be judgmental men. To the rest that says, I trust in God. This is what He's done for me. This is what He can also do for you. This is how when our faith, our heart is turned to Him. He has amazing things to show us if He is. I want unbelievers all across the world to be connected to Jesus. And guess what? They're not just going to do that through someone like me. They're going to be in every single one of you. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You are the church. I am not the sole person in this church. You are the church. So don't be afraid to grow your faith. Don't be afraid to find your authenticity in Christ. Don't be afraid to work on your intimacy with how you pray to God. Don't be afraid to show your loyalty, even in the midst of pressure and time People pushing in all around you and say, I can believe in God. I, I don't know. I guess I, I don't know why I believe in God. <coughs> yes, you do. Every single one of you has a reason. Be ready to tell them. Be ready to find them. And maybe it's as simple as Daniel proved it to me. And you know his story? Let me tell you this. There are ways for unbelievers to find that connection with Jesus through you. Because you have more influence than you think. 
As we're wrapping up today, guys, this is what I'm going to leave you with. The last two verses of this chapter. What happens to the Indians? The king returned and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment he brought him. He couldn't sleep. He knew he'd done wrong. He has to be unconscious. He doesn't have to take any life. I don't know where she's up. I don't know where she's going to He had a conscience. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and heard the lion's den. Guess what? The book foreshadowed Mary Magdalene. He looked at the first light. She was in. When, the, when he came near the end, he called him Daniel, saying, The name which was Daniel, servant of the living God. Did you catch that? Daniel, servant of the living God. This is an unbeliever, a pagan king. Daniel, servant of the living God. Even an unbeliever can find God through your example, if you'll let them, if you'll show them. Daniel, servant of the living God. Has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? And Daniel said, May the king live forever. Boom. Drop the mic. I'm still here. My God can shut the mouth of lies. Can your staff do that? I don't think so. My God can. So I don't tell my God how big my storm is. I tell that storm how big my God is. My God sent his angel and shut the mouth of the lions. They have not hurt because I was found innocent in his sight. Nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. And the king was overjoyed, and he gave the order to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no one was found on him because he had trusted in his God. In Persian culture, if you lie about something and you're wrongly convicted someone else, guess what happens? A Persian has the same thing that you have someone else done. They do it to you. The king's command, the men who falsely accused James were brought in and thrown into the lion's den. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all the bones. Sad, right? Then King Darius wrote to all the nations and all the peoples in every language in all the earth, May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence. The God of Daniel, for he is the living God. You don't serve a dead God. You serve a living God. You serve a God that sees everything you go through, and he can empathize with you, and he can hold you, and he can help you. He is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed, no matter what government or what people try to do to slam Christianity. They will not destroy it. His kingdom will never be destroyed. His dominion will never end. That is the words of a king who was an unbeliever, pagan, statue worshiping, idol driven king. He says he rescues and he saves and he performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He's rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. Verse 28. So Daniel prospered during the reign of King Darius. In the reign of Cyrus of Persia. Let me show you what this next picture looks like. When the culture of that world saw Daniel as a young exiled captive, God saw what? God saw a miracle. When this 15 year old kid has no business changing the lives of entire nations because he doesn't know and he's not smart enough, and he's not strong enough, and he's not powerful enough, guess what? Guess who's fighting for him? God saw a miracle of influence. When the whole world saw nothing, a slave, a cat, a boy, nothing, God saw a miracle and changed the world because of his influence. Look at this picture right here. It's not until our commitment to God is tested that we discover how committed to God we really are and how powerful our influence can really be. When you're going through a test, don't think that God doesn't love you. Don't think that God has forsaken you. Don't think that God has left you. God is here and he cares about you and he is working with you through that test. And in fact, you would never think that this person, this next person on the next slide, would ever be an influencer for God. This is a, this is a, a sultry carpet of King Darius that is over in the Holy Land. I issue the decree that in every part of my kingdom, the people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. He is the living God and he endures forever. 
His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. God made an influencer out of one man named Daniel. And Daniel, by his committed character, made an influencer out of kings. Not one, multiples. Don't think, don't think for one second that your faith can't thrive in a hostile society. Because when God puts you someplace and lets you bloom, He'll show you how He plans to move in your life and change others for Him. That's what I want to do with today. So, guys, if you want to stand your hands, pray your hands with me. Or if there's someone here today who doesn't know me, if there's someone here today that feels like, well, I'm not an influencer, I can't be like Daniel, I don't know what Daniel do, I can't. I can't, I don't have the bravery of Daniel. When someone starts to think like that, Lord, I pray that they're remembering our summer from last weekend. They're remembering how Jesus came to the Samaritan woman at the well. Somebody who was never going to be thought of as an influencer. And from today's sermon, the kings who were unbelievers changed for God, the real, true God of heaven. That's not a coincidence. That is an amazing truth because of your faith. Father God, I thank you for the committed character of faith that Daniel displayed. I thank you for the depth that it shows us. I thank you for the guidance that it shows us. I thank you for the hope that it gives me. Lord, the, the, the thought of being able to thrive in a society where sometimes it can be hostile to someone who considers himself a Christian. Lord, I pray that every single person in this room today, every single person can and know, Father, that through your risen Son, Jesus, they have that great power that raised them from the dead. The Holy Spirit can move in us in a way that can change people's lives out of love and out of committed character. Lord, I pray that today, if someone is sitting here and they don't think that they can influence others, I pray that you can go and appeal to their heart and show them that well, sometimes the smallest things. The smallest little word, the smallest, genuine, most genuine, kind, loving expression, the smallest act of love can make such a difference for somebody who is seeking to Lord, I pray today that when all of us in this sanctuary today look around and say, I'm not an answer, I'm not an expert, I can't do that. I pray that you would appreciate and help show them that they are called, they are gifted, they are anointed, they are, they are elevated by you, Father, to be your salt and light in what sometimes can be a very dark world. Today, Lord, help us to see you. Help us to trust you. When man's plans try to tear us in one different way, help us to remember that all we need to remember is standards perseverance and committed character. What a foreshadowing of your soul. You came to this earth and died for our sins. But thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his sacrifice. Thank you for, because of that, I trust you and I believe in you and I commit to you. I'll be in a place one day where there is no There is no hurt. There is no death. There are no people waiting to try to do Thank you for this promise, Father. I mean, you all pray about that today. I pray that every single person here can feel your influence so they can be exalted. In Jesus Christ, holy and precious name.